play but play by the rules steve oh how it feels so good to see that red arrow move forward it's been too long since recording a track welcome to farming god i'm steve ray what you just heard was a dog attack and today is a conversation with a dog trainer writer and philosopher on the other end of that scuffle we spoke a few months back in an abandoned Air Force base in the high desert of West Texas about David Sleeper's new book, Imprinting Morality in Dogs and Humans. The show will make you think about big things and little ones, like the similarities between mice and horses. Last episode, I said I would have a plan to support my podcasting endeavors. Well, halfway through this episode, you'll hear just that a plan. If there's a way we could work together, email steveraymedia at gmail.com. Enjoy, Mr. Sleeper. Play by the rules, Steve. Cool. This shouldn't be too painful. I'll try oh, to I'm, make, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'll make it as... I'm as worried as I was without a dog attack. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, uh, you mind introducing yourself and your partner here? My name's Sleeper, um, David Sleeper. This is Tejona Yolanda Garcia Lujan Rodriguez Salmanderos de Montoya. She's a, looks like a blue healer cross. She was locked in a horse trailer in Nebraska as an untrainable dog. They were going to put her down. Her backstory was she was, um, her mother died when she was born and she was raised on a bottle with a sweet talk and sugar mama with no dogs around. Mm-hmm. And so she grew up as kind of a spoiled human child. And then when she went to a real farm that knew this breed for generations and generations, she couldn't be trained through normal dog training methods. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she was killing chickens and they gave up. Mm-hmm. And they said, we don't recommend anybody get her, but we're going to put her down in two days. But if you think you can do mm. something, come get her quick. Mm. And how long ago was that? Six years. So the podcast that I do focuses a bit on spirituality. I mean, I don't confine things to the material world. So do you mind talking a little bit about your spiritual upbringing personally? Oh, it's, I, I was raised in religious shame. My father was a fur trapper, and he knocked up a preacher's daughter, a registered nurse, pick of the litter. Um, she was supposed to marry a preacher and all that. And um, so huge religious shame. They got married on 20 bucks. They had to leave the state of Minnesota down to Iowa, told stories of rats in my crib, that kind of thing. And um, they took that religious shame and didn't really learn from it they just they obeyed even more conformed even more and for one example is they there was five of us kids i was the first then and and we were all really pushed to marry our first person we dated and that happened with my siblings it didn't happen with me they changed the dates and they could have said hey here's what happened to us we made a mistake and it didn't work out so good Um, so we want you to learn from our mistake. Instead, they changed the dates and act like it never happened, and then we had no idea why we were being pushed into marriage. So there's nothing learned there other than more marriages, you know, that we're rushed into. Um, And that's kind of a typical pattern that seems to happen when you're... It In my world, it goes back to that sense of self. Um... It's very important to have a good sense of self. And like we're talking about this dog here, she rehabilitated herself. She has a self-identity because I did the exact opposite of normal dog training where you're coercing an identity. You're forcing an identity, requiring obedience, and you bribe, you punish, and you judge. In my world, that all creates separation. And then the the product, your kid or your dog or whatever, doesn't have their own identity. And they kind of live in fear Mm. because they don't 
Without a good sense of self, it's really hard to understand the world, much less yourself. It's very hard to learn from your mistakes. It's hard to, to make sense of things. If you don't, can't learn from your mistakes without a sense of self, you can't understand yourself, you can't understand somebody else or understand the divine. So in sense of a spiritual sense, without a good sense of self, then all your relationships have got a problem. Mm. But if you do understand yourself and you can learn from your mistakes, then you can have in being in a relationship with somebody else or a dog or a mule or a horse or whatever it would be, or the divine, or love yourself or love somebody else or love the divine and not have a codependent, needy relationship on any of that. Because so when you don't have that good, strong sense of self-awareness, then really codependency sets in and codependency is fatal. You don't die of old age, you die of immune system dysfunction. Did you personally experience a flip at some point? Um, a big flip for me was when my father told me when I wouldn't go serve in Vietnam, he had a pistol blow up on him when he was a kid, 17 or something. He was supposed to go to Korea, and now he lost an eyeball. Mm -hmm. And so he was both handicapped and couldn't go to war. He had to stay home with the women and children. And so when Vietnam came along, <clears throat> um, since it looked like I wasn't going to be a preacher, and save him from his sins that way, I could go off to war. And he really said me, told me he didn't care if I came home in a box, but I needed to go to war and um, be a patriot and, and really save him from his sins in a sense. You know, he, was hope he told my grandfather that I would be a, a very, um, I would be a very good kid and prove that he was a worthy husband and father. So he was invested that who, how I turned out would save him, basically. Mm. And so when I didn't, I said, I'm not going to Nam. Then he told me how they changed the dates and how I'd ruined his life since the moment I was conceived. This is a very good man. Yeah. Um, he, was a, he became a county sheriff eventually, and people loved him, and he was very, very good, but he was not very good with me because he was always, I needed to, to not have my own life. I needed to obey and become what he needed me to be become. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went through many years before we finally did get together and uh, uh, had a good relationship, but it took a long, long time. So you're writing currently <clears throat> your first book? Yeah. What's the title of it and what's it about? It's called Imprinting Morality for Dogs and Humans. Okay. And what's it about? Um, it's a novel. Um, I'm have taken my various experiences and sort of put them into this novel form, um, and uh, in in my world, I, I'm I'm kind of I'm, I'm really out of the box. I've had like 50 years no television, and I haven't read other dog training books, which this is sort of disguised as. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm not academic. Um, and so that really helps me just look at certain things and go, whoa, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of outside of our unified field, if you want to put it in quantum physics words, quantum physics terminology. Um, we, we normally live in this unified field of all these thoughts that have gone before us and have produced this unified field of this is how you be a dog trainer, this is how you be a parent, this is how you be a lover, this is how you serve God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. And since I'm out of that, it gives me a better view, um, perhaps. <clears throat> yeah. And so I've sort of written a book about that. So as a dog trainer... Um, I help people with their dogs, and it's very easy, and, and um, the dogs rehabilitate really quickly. Young kids rehabilitate, get their own self-identity very quickly. Um, the longer we've been in our bodies, this seemed to be the harder for some folks, and some folks do really well. They've been looking for this sort of common sense their whole life. But basically, like with a dog, I don't micromanage. I don't use the word no. Mm -hmm. I would never bribe. Mm -hmm. Um, bribery creates that treats and everything creates impulsive behavior, the need for the quick reward, short attention span. Mm -hmm. And um, it also makes an addiction. 
you're relating to the child or the kid's stomach. Mm -hmm. And then they're set up for addiction for the rest of their life. Because, and then so drugs or alcohol, sex addiction, fundamentalist religion addiction, religious addiction, etc., all become very attractive because you're teaching through that bribery, you're creating an addict, and then you have addictive behavior. In the case of our dogs and our kids, when we see a trained dog or trained kid, we just think that's how they're supposed to be because that's what that unified field has taught us. Hmm. This is the product we're looking for. Sit. Oh, what a great dog. Look, it obeyed me, you know. And <clears throat> so I don't do any of that because in my world that creates separation, plus it's coercing an identity upon that individual or that dog. And I see problems with that. When you don't have your own sense of self, like I mentioned earlier, then it's really hard to make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And then so you're more fear-based, especially if you then also with the bribery comes the punishment and the judgment. So you become afraid of, mis of, of not obeying your dog owner or your parents or your God. Mm -hmm. And that really is a pretty toxic thing. So you've got fear-based codependency, a lack of self-identity, and then... If you are also taught in a religious sense, going back to the spiritual thing, that if you conform and obey properly, then God will love you and then you'll be accepted and now you're chosen. And those people who are not obeying properly, well, they're going to hell anyway. So it really doesn't matter what you think of them or how you treat them because God doesn't like them anyway. Hmm. We model after our concept of the divine which in historical terms and more of a fundamental end of things is a divine of separation. Not everyone's welcome in God's heaven. And when we look at each other, we're looking at sinful mortals that need to be saved. We're not looking at another aspect of creation, another face of God. So I, I'm neither a, a dog training book connoisseur, but it, to me it seems maybe what you're saying is you're sort of blurring the lines with training dogs and training humans uh, in that there's a lot of overlap between those two. Oh, yeah, and I think we get it all from horses. <laughs> Where did they come into the picture? Horses play a huge thing in civilization. You know, the, mm. the warriors that learn to ride horses, the Huns or whatever, they really won a lot of the battles. The archers the, and horses help plow the fields, et cetera, et cetera. And horses are extremely unique in nature. Um, there's the only other thing, other animal like a horse I can think of right off the bat is, is, is a mouse. You can... Um, mouses are real pure prey animals. You can get an automatic mouse trap that catches live mice, and you can catch a dozen because one goes, "Hey, I'm, I'm in here eating the food," and the other one goes, "I'm," and then they're and they're caught too. Mm -hmm. There is no automatic rat trap. Rats are thinkers. Mice are impulsive prey animals. Rats are anti predator. If a, a rattlesnake wants to get a rat, you got to be careful. Or a road runner, or a ringtail or whatever, you know, you, rats are like mules. Mules have big, long ears. Horses have little, short ears. Horses, what helps create an animal oftentimes is the predator. When the horse was wild, the predator, the terrain it was in, the predator was the wolf. And the wolves hunt in packs. The horse that stood around thinking when it saw a wolf and worrying about its family, let's make a plan, I wonder how many wolves there are, I want to, let's take care of each other. Well, the wolf's hunt and pack and the horse that stood around thinking is wolf lunch and can't pass on thinking behavior because it can't have babies. Mm -hmm. It's dead. The horse that saw a wolf, I'm out of here, gone. I don't care about family. I don't care where I'm going. I don't care about being sure-footed. I'm just impulsively out of here. That's the one that can live and make babies. So over time, the horse's ears aren't like the elk and the moose and the deer and mules and burros and all that stuff. Big old ears as thinkers, they got little bitty ears because they're not processing. When you, when you spook a burrow and it runs off, its head's going from side to side looking behind it. It needs information, information, information. If you spook a mule, it's doing part of that. It's looking around a lot. When you spook a deer, as soon as it can, after it goes boing, boing, and bounces off, it wants to turn around those big old ears and get information. Mm -hmm. 
because everything in the pretty much in the even in the insect world, or spiders, etc., survive by making wise decisions and gathering information with whatever you know. An insect can have all these eyes. <laughs> you know, a spider has six eyes. A, a fly has all these faceted. I mean, it's amazing how they gather information. A horse, no. Yeah. And so when you're not a thinker, you respond to domination because pecking order becomes very, very important. And, um, and then when pecking order is very important and you're not a thinker, you don't want to share. So when you put food out for horses, they fight over it. And the lead mare or whoever is in charge just beats the crap out of everybody else and then greedily gobbles the f- grain down, keeping everyone else at bay and eating way more than they should, you know. That's what a horse does because they're a non-thinker and pecking order. Um, king of the hill is everything. Now you take mules, you put grain out for mules, they call each other over, unless they've been ruined through food, but mm-hmm. a basic unruined mule calls his buddies over, hey, potluck, they all like eating together. They love the community. They like to share. When you're a thinker, you like to share. When you're a non-thinker, you don't like to share. So my problem was, is that I see how we are trained like horses because we as, humans. as humans, we dominate and we have a pecking order and we require obedience and we force an identity and we bribe and we punish and we judge and we create separation. And so a good horse trained kid then, or dog, grows up to be impulsive, not learning from their mistakes, not thinking, not having good self-discipline. And if you throw a religious concept on top of that and say, you know, don't think, just obey, then you'll have God's favor and you'll even get eternal rewards. And if you don't, you'll get punished for eternity. This show is brought to you by Steve Ray Media. I may not be able to support myself directly from my shows, but the expertise I've developed over the last four years can definitely help others turn their concepts into a reality. From content creation to live events and podcasting education, Steve Ray Media creates and captures media that inspires. And the best part is, I'm not alone. With a team of incredibly talented creatives, we're able to deliver high-quality video, audio, photography, and live event coordination. To see examples of our work, head to steveraymedia.com. We, I mean, we spent the morning afternoon chatting about things, and you have a pretty vast array of experiences that have gone back for however many years you've been on this earth. Do you remember the moment you knew you were going to write a book about um, sort of about Doug, human training? Um, I broke an ankle yeah. in a hailstorm on a motorcycle on a ranch. And um, I, I it, a, a big storm just fell out of the sky and just all of a sudden you can't see and there's hail and huge wind. It was just a real, my dog's on the back of the motorcycle and and I, the, the grass was thick because we had a wet year and it's waving and I can't see my little trail. I can't see through my, it's just, it's just, I'm just trying to turn around and get out of there. But I crossed a, what's called a fast line. It's a, it's a plastic pipe mm-hmm. and it, I'm only going about four miles an hour, but it, it just cranked the wheel and dropped me into a Choya cactus face first and um, broke my ankle. Mm-hmm. And I'm an EMT and I could tell my ankle was twisted and I couldn't figure out which way it was twisted. Oh, and I had to God. get out of there anyway, and the storm's coming down. So it's kind of one of those things. But so it's like this, what appears to be a horrible tragedy. And, you know, I've been working on trying to figure things out for a while. And in the moment that that happened, my first thought wasn't darn or damn or a curse word. It was, oh, I wonder who I'm going to meet. Because obviously my life's going to be different with a broken leg. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I might not even get out of this, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't didn't really think of that. I figured I'd get out of it. But so then I had to pull the leg out, but I couldn't get it out and I couldn't figure out which way to untwist so I could pick the bike off of me and get where I can pick it up. And so I just had to keep tugging, but that dragged the whole motorcycle further into this Choya cactus, which they're not fun cactus. (laughs) Um, 
and there's rain and the hail's coming down and who knows where the dog is it's bopped off somewhere and and so I had to just jerk it really really hard knowing I'm doing more damage and then I got this dangly foot you know and then I got to stand up and then I got to get the bike up and then I got to drive out of there but where it's pointing that's a bad place to go and I I probably couldn't go there in a good day you know, all these rocks and trees and everything on the hillside and but I don't have any choice and so off I go and um, what I've learned in my kind of answer your question in my experience that it's you have all this divine help to do what you came here to do if you're not judgmental and you don't have negative thoughts because if you're if you are judgmental and have negative thoughts this is my belief at this point in time that it's not so easy for them to really help you because you still have those lessons to learn so you cannot you don't get rescued you don't get saved <laughs> yeah. we are here to figure out what we came to figure out and so if they interfere they're interfering with our will and they help present all these different master teachers that push our buttons in various ways various experiences etc so i'm seeing myself as having sort of a graduation experience because i didn't say darn while you were on the motorcycle well, riding through this rocky terrain. Well, I didn't have, well, I had the wreck. And then I'm not looking at this as any kind of a tragedy. And so I make it through the rocky stuff, which I shouldn't be able to. I find the trail, get the dog back on. But then the last bit was um, some floodplain area that now had this water and hail on top of it. And it was just like an ice skating rink with the motorcycle. And I knew I couldn't get through that. So I'm going kind of pretty fast because I'm going to, Go as far as I can, ride the bike down, make sure this dangly leg is not involved in the next wreck, mm -hmm. and then crawl the rest of the way to this trailer house I lived on in a remote spot on this ranch, the 30,000-acre ranch on the middle of nowhere. And I made it through. It really didn't make any sense. And then, um, but so that's, now I've got a broken leg, and so then I had broken ankle, and uh, now I've got time to, okay, why is this happening? Oh, maybe I should write a book. Mm. And so that got it going, and then I, I got a bunch of it done, and then it was like, I can't be doing this ranch work anymore unless it's part-time. I need to finish this. Mm. And then I ended up here at this... This is called the International Women's Foundation, Building 98 in Marfa, Texas, and they have an author-in-residence uh, writer uh, program, artist-in-residence program, and, mm -hmm. and here I am mm -hmm. as an official author writing, <laughs> thanks to the broken ankle and the hailstorm mm -hmm. and the attitude that didn't make it a tragedy. Yeah. When you think about a potential reader this book who do you envision um it's designed to be a movie and i i'm totally convinced it's going to just go all the way it's the, the time is so ripe with this with the me too thing and mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> the whole there's such a polarities in what's going on right now and and i think in in my my view i think um we have a lot to thank this guy named Trump for because uh, um, there's been such negativity brewing and negativity doesn't get saved. It doesn't just all of a sudden go away because you've got conscious people or whatever, non-negative people running the show. Um, when you have a negative thought, it's not a, there's no free lunch. We have to deal with that stuff. Just like positive thoughts create a positive um, unified field. And uh, well, thoughts are things. So somehow that had to pop, that pimple had to pop. And so we had a, the pendulum swung over to the Obama end of things. So that really brought out the racism and, and whatnot and a lot of negativity and a lot of folks that that in the old days in the rural when you're chopping wood and carrying water you're in touch with the soil in touch with plants in touch with the critters that was the salt of the earth well as as things got more modern and whatnot and uh 
it, they're just a lot of those salt of the earth people. Um, I, my father was an example of it. They just, he got involved with going to coffee with some negative folks and, and he became racist himself. And, um, it's, it's pretty interesting how powerful people get energy from being negative and judgmental and they, they pack together. Now, in terms of dog training, I feel a, a conventionally trained dog that ends up being impulsive, for example, doesn't recognize that's a porcupine from 50 feet away or that's a skunk or that's a rattlesnake like Tejona would or a, or a fox or a coyote or, or a wolf would. Um, that dog doesn't recognize because it's not reading the energetic signal. It's not thinking before it acts. It's been learned to be impulsive, mm -hmm. totally anti-predator. And it runs over to the porcupine and gets nailed and gets get nailed and finally gives up and then has to go through all the pain and getting those spines out of its face. Next porcupine, it says, oh, porcupine, right back into it again. I know a vet's got her dog 15 times has gone into porcupines. The way we conventionally train our dogs and our kids as modeled after that horse stuff, I think. And so the rural people that were the salt of the earth... It worked on their horse. It must work on their kids and their spouses and their employees, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, it's so to you, you know, and if it doesn't work, you require more obedience. And it was modeling after that God of if you don't conform, if you don't obey, I'm going to get you or the devil will get you or somebody's going to get you. You know, you have to obey. Don't think. Just like the horses, we break their spirits. You know, we got to break the horse till they just obey. Mm. And we do it to the kids and we do it to the dogs. And it creates separation, not oneness. Humans today have a, uh, especially in 2018, have a sort of self centeredness about us um, that I, I think is pretty palpable. How would you respond to someone who says or is skeptical about the emotional capacity of a dog to really heed these teachings that you're, you're talking about? I ride around this little town of Marfa with a dog on the back of the motorcycle, Tejona, and um, we meet people. There's a lot. It's a dog-friendly town, and then they're, you know, like, getting towed down the street but the dog is just towing them or they're impulse impulse you know they're not they're running the show they're and the people are doing all the micromanaging and they're trying to get the dog to behave and they take them into the local hotels and stuff and and the dogs are all you know it's just an impulsive mess sometimes and um, over and over again I meet people and I always carry some elk jerky in my pocket and I and I get permission from the folks, you want to see something different here. And, and I just lay that food down in front of the dog and claim it. I use my hand. I'm empowering my hand as a space-claiming device. And my energy is noble and dignified and majestic. And I actually think I create a pharaoh they've been looking for their whole life. Um, scientists have discovered now that we create pharaohs when we're afraid, for example, that create a biophysical reaction in the people around us and those that are susceptible to fear, like on an airplane, then they create their own pharaohs, which create biophysical reaction to people around them. Hmm. Well, they also discovered, and this is in Rochester University, that um, disgust creates a pharaoh and creates a biophysical reaction in the people around you. So the ones that are susceptible to disgust get more disgusted and create their pharaoh, and it just keeps spreading. So you think of people that are getting into all this negativity. They're creating pharaohs. They're creating biophysical reaction in the people that are susceptible. Well, in my case, I feel I create a pharaoh that a dog or a child has been looking for their whole life. A non-micromanaging, something has to do with oneness, something has to do with space claiming, not judging, not punishing, not requiring obedience. So I set that jerky on the ground and I claim it. And I back up and trust. And now that dog, who normally always gets the treats, but the energy is all different here. You, have, you personally have this sort of vibrancy about you. I don't know if you knew that. Did you? 
I, 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 <laughs> How did you develop that? I mean, life obviously throws its weird twists and turns and hailstorms at you. Um, where does this sort of optimistic, I would, would you call yourself an optimist? And if so, where would, where did that come from? I think it's more of just how I would sort of answer your question is that sense of self that's not codependent, it's not needy. I don't need anything from anybody else or the divine in that sense. Mm -hmm. I am a, on a quest to know more about myself, do self-discovery, explore the world, and keep developing non-judgmental and positive attitudes. And, and then I live by serendipity. So what you're really picking up on is probably a serendipity thing where so I just sort of get on that motorcycle with the dog and, and put it out there and um, I see where I'm led, so to speak, because I'm available. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like in the old days, I hitchhiked a lot and it could be raining or snowing. I don't care if someone passes me by. That's totally fine because that's not my ride. I'm waiting for my ride. And so I'm not, you know, making an insulting gesture or something when someone doesn't stop or I don't want to go. It's not my ride. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for my, if I have to wait two days for my ride, that's totally fine with me. I'm not attached to each car going by. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for my magic ride, the person I'm supposed to meet. And I'm trusting the divine to set this all up. And sure enough, it works out. You have this amazing experience and you go places that, Lots of times I wouldn't have a goal. I'm just going to go where the magic rides take me. And so that was a really good exercise in how this works, the serendipity. If you could have a billboard right here on the highway in Marfa, what would it say? Be still and know God. Really? Would you consider yourself a religious person? No, not at all. That was a quick answer. <laughs> um, but very spiritual. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I, you saw that video of that dog attack. You might have seen somebody who was not afraid there. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't get eaten by that dog, that Great Dane. Yeah. And, and if I would have then I would go with that experience. But there's just something when you mean well and you're not judgmental and you're not negative, you just have lots of help. Mm -hmm. It's like those things we call angels are just like coming out of retirement that we've put them into with our negative thoughts and our judgmental thoughts and they really can't do a whole lot. And all of a sudden we become a wonderful project because we're open and Mm -hmm. And um, and then their I feel their job is to help us do why we incarnated. I feel we choose our parents, we chose the situation we've had many lifetimes. We are, and we're not, we're not having a lifetime where we're being punished or something. We're choosing all this stuff. We're going well. I was that race and that economic status and that type of person. I want to try this now. I had a really easy lifetime. Let me try a really rough one. I'm going to, I'm going to be an insane person or, or, or whatever. Uh, we're coming to the end. Is there anything that we didn't hit on anything that you'd like to finish with? We covered quite a, quite a array. And I love how you're constantly bringing back in <laughs> these ideas of dog training into these questions of morality and self. <laughs> it's such a trip. The last thing I could just say in terms of my own personal experience, I mentioned you earlier, and I'll say it just really briefly, but I had this experience where I lived on the ranch on the border and the Mexican mafia was trying to buy the ranch in Mexico, and I bought it out from underneath them, a guy named Pablo Costa that books are written about, a big mafia dude. And that started the 10-year mafia wars, and uh, the, um, the local sheriff here was helping the mafia, and... I got the FBI involved, and they said, we can't help you because this sheriff is too high connected up on our government. And then word came down, the uh, local Border Patrol agents told me, he says, watch your back because we've been told something big's going to happen at your ranch. 
and we can't go there, don't go there, no matter what you hear. Watch your back. They said, you've been marked by our government because you're standing in the way of commerce. And um, living on the border for 25 years down here, and now I guess to 29 by now, um, uh, I'm very aware, especially in the old days, that a lot of the law enforcement was involved in taking care of the competition, and there was a, a channel bought off and paid for that went high up in our government. And um, I was up against that by myself. Uh, so the FBI couldn't even help me. Lloyd Benson was big enough. He helped me a little bit. Um, but I was pretty much on my own. And five times over 10 years, that mafia invaded and took possession. And five times we got them off. Twice in Ojinaga in Mexican court and once in Chihuahua City. What, what do you mean invaded? They took possession. Captured my people, put them in jail sometimes. Your employees? They, yes, on the Mexican ranch. Jeez. You can't own land outright in Mexico. You have to have Mexican partners, so it's already a little goofy. But, you know, they, we, we, they bought off a judge. We got him fired, made all the papers. But so I'm just this one guy, basically, mm -hmm. um, and finding wonderful people in Mexico to help me because I'm not judging. I'm not going to that sheriff or to that mafia dude that replaced Pablo Costa, Juan Rombaesa, and saying, you know, rattling swords and doing an ego thing. A testosterone thing. I'm just claiming space, the universal language analysts, without judging. And I'm telling them, I'm just claiming this. I'm just trying to keep you out, your business out of my neighborhood. That's my business. You got your business, I got my business. I'm not going to hurt you. And uh, when, when um, a spot would sit, open up next to him in the courtroom, I'd go sit next to him, you know, and he has a wife and kids. I spot him in a Mexican rodeo, I'd go say, hey, what's going on? I never treated him as an enemy. And, and so I had the divine help, and my people are still on that ranch. The sheriff went to jail for a lifetime with no parole. Mm -hmm. And the mafia good dude, last I heard he got divorced, was living underneath a bridge. Wow. But I'm just sharing that because when you don't judge and you don't have negative thoughts and you claim space, you have help. Mr. Sleeper, this was quite the conversation. It was fantastic, and I can't wait for the book. And the title, again, is... In Printing Morality for Dogs and Humans. 